My name is Clark Kimmerer. Uh, it is a privilege for me to present the uh, discussion and examination of recovery, disaster recovery, and the role, uh, hopefully an expanded role, that GIS can provide in a comprehensive approach to dealing with the aftermath of, of a disaster. Uh, I had my career with the Seattle Police Department, 31 years. Uh, interestingly, in that, uh, in that tenure, I was also the director of the Seattle Emergency Operations Center and oversaw the emergency management section, kind of an unusual construct. I'm also a member of the uh, National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. So the hats I'm gonna be wearing are numerous, but really focused on emergency management as it concerns the recovery from catastrophe. As a kind of theme, I want to present to you at the outset. It's been my belief for a long time that GIS is absolutely vital to the coordination and the planning and the analysis and the predictive uh, requirements to deal with all phases of a disaster, but in particular in recovery. And I would argue, and I will be arguing, that it's underutilized in many places. The reason that GIS is so important to all aspects of public safety and, and rest restoration of the, the basic things we need in humanity is because, as I've said to many people in, over the years, the power of GIS is that everything, almost everything, that can or will happen occurs in a place and at a time. That's a pretty fundamental description of what GIS can provide. Not just a single spot on a map, but all the intersections of other functions and critical infrastructure, uh, identifying needs, uh, looking at how, say, even ICS is being deployed uh, in the context of a myriad of different factors uh, having to do with disaster response, mitigation preparedness, and recovery. But in order to get to the heart of uh, this presentation uh, and uh, what my colleagues will be also providing you, uh, we need to have a baseline understanding of recovery, of the systems that are very, very typically uh, implemented to recover from a disaster. I have some personal experience in this. Again, I was the EOC director and emergency management director as collateral duties in my police career and oversaw several uh, iterations of our disaster recovery plan as, and was the recovery manager uh, for several disasters over the course of my career. So I'm gonna bring that perspective. Uh, it's a basic perspective, namely who should be around that table? Who should I have available to me uh, to coordinate the most effective recovery effort we can think of? Now the component parts of a recovery system, again, are fairly well established. Let me just run through them for you. The first and foremost, most important for really anything that's of moment and significance is leadership. Uh, systems of leadership, but also leaders. The second is the establishment of what we call a recovery task force. I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. Third, uh, recovery efforts are organized around what are typically called recovery support functions. And binding all of this together, is what we term a recovery coordination center. So let's take each of these in turn. The recovery leadership question is often answered by the senior elected official and her or his team. The mayor of a city, for example, or county executive could very well be the recovery task force leader, but very often a prominent member of uh, the community is often asked to uh, step into that role. Could be somebody from the business community, could be a former mayor or other significant uh, leader. Uh, it could be something with uh, somebody with specific ties to the community, you know, even a, like a church leader, folks like that. And that is the binding uh, uh, kind of principle is to find a leadership cadre and in particular a, a leader that represents community, that represents the interests of community, that is going to bring expertise, potentially beyond governmental expertise, into the overall comprehensive recovery effort. Next is the 
establishment of uh, what are called recovery support functions. Uh, there are a number of recovery support functions, but they really tend to be fairly standardized. Uh, they derive from uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency guidelines for recovery, uh, and they are, are hopefully going to cover the myriad of specific needs and interests uh, that need to be satisfied as we attempt to recover from catastrophe. Typically, they're going to be uh, recovery support functions for human and social services, external affairs, environment, the economic restoration of community, infrastructure, particularly critical infrastructure, housing, medical and health, transportation, and a very important one, natural and cultural and historic interests. These recovery support functions are multidisciplinary, multidepartmental. They are going to be spelled out in some level of detail uh, in any kind of uh, recovery support, uh, recovery um, plan, comprehensive disaster recovery plan. And the, the numerous departments and interests that are going to make up these support functions will be spelled out. Now, they can be modified. Uh, and again, I'm gonna be arguing that uh, in many of these categories, these support functions, GIS has a significant place. Uh, but we'll go into that in a little more detail. Uh, the third kind of component, the third leg of the stool of a, of a comprehensive recovery system uh, is the what we call a recovery coordination center. It's oftentimes staffed or even uh, convened in the emergency management section of uh, many cities or counties or regions. Uh, it is the place that uh, the work is being done, that action plans are being formalized. Uh, and it's also the place uh, that the round table that consists of the important voices and constituents within the recovery support functions gather to plan. It's a very ICS-centric uh, sort of approach uh, with planning being you know, a significant part of all the work that's done. But it's also typically the place where all the voices that need to be heard can be heard, that are sought out to contribute to the, the complica complicated endeavor called disaster recovery. You know, it's, it's probably worth kind of talking about, you know, well, when does recovery begin? When do these systems typically stand up? Uh, it is uh, probably convenient and mechanical to say, well, after uh, the response uh, effort is, is substantially completed, uh, where the situation has reached a level of stability, that there's some transition to recovery. And I, I think that's an accurate way of summarizing it. But really, when does recovery start for any place that has to contemplate disaster? Right now, in times of calm, before the disaster. And I would also argue, having been both an incident commander, uh, response coordinator for the city, as well as recovery manager, uh, I would say recovery starts uh, right to the left of boom immediately after the disaster has made itself manifest and, re and response is underway. Not to overshadow response, not to overshadow the life safety and incident stabilization requirements of uh, any kind of response, but to start the process of planning, thinking, what ifing the requirements for uh, recovery. Because that word is Im critically important. When we establish priorities in a recovery task force through a recovery coordination center, staffed by recovery support functions, those priorities are defined by requirements. What we need to do and in what order we need to do them. We know, and, and this is actually a melding of response and recovery, that there are critical things that need to be done as soon as humanly possible damage assessments, debris removal, the restoration of power, water, communications, the uh, enabling of the public safety and governmental functions to be restored to not an optimal level, but a functioning level. Those are elements of recovery just as much of response, but in response, they have to be done as quickly as possible uh, because there's a lot of stake in fighting a uh, a, a comprehensive um, and, and tot you know, total catastrophic incident 
and not having those essential components and elements uh, on, your, on your side. So identifying requirements is one of the key parts of the recovery function. That's that round table I'm talking to you about. That's where in the recovery coordination center, the voices that need to be part of a comprehensive recovery planning initiative are heard. They are sought out. Their capabilities uh, are uh, utilized to the maximum extent that uh, they can be. Uh, it's a think tank. The, 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 the formula that is often used is what if, and if, what then? So here's my uh, transition in the argument about the role of GIS. We know that uh, GIS is an absolutely critical component to really any disaster response uh, and, and ultimately recovery. Uh, we see that so often in uh, hurricane and certainly in wildfires where ICS got its uh, birthplace. Uh, but here's how I would characterize it in many jurisdictions, not all. I think there are a lot of progressive uh, jurisdictions out there that are, are uh, going to agree with some of the things I'm saying. In many, many cases, if not most, the role of GIS I would describe as a series of taskings. So envision this round table that I'm talking about. Envision this planning group, recovery support functions, the, the, the convening of, of the recovery uh, comprehensive planning effort. Some things identified oftentimes, or many things are identified. They represent a need. We need to have maps of particular areas, inundation maps. We need to you know, have uh, you know, particular maybe uh, aerial photographs and or, you know, uh, uh, comprehensive GIS mapping of critical infrastructure, uh, where things maybe intersect, um, you know, maybe where there are some vulnerabilities. But it's a, uh, an ad hoc and to do kind of function. So uh, not infrequently, some of our great GIS technicians and science scientists and managers and leaders uh, make themselves available to help on particular jobs, particular priorities identified. Here is the argument I will be making, uh, and I think our colleagues in this presentation will also be reinforcing, that GIS should be part of every phase and facet of the planning endeavor, both for response, but certainly for recovery. Not just a please do this and give us the product, but a place at the table when these important conversations are taking place. When we're talking about issues like equity and vulnerable populations and the rebuilding of uh, a, a damaged, a wounded society. I want, I, I've always wanted uh, a GIS team uh, that I could turn to and say, what do you think of this? What can you provide uh, toward this end? What are we missing? Uh, what if we can do this? What, what then? Uh, that to me is a gold standard of, of an operational integration, a recovery integration. Let's remember in many really catastrophic incidents, recovery goes on for years. And it's in those years that both opportunities and vulnerabilities often may, are made manifest. The opportunities uh, are pretty profound and they've been shown in numerous jurisdictions throughout this country, Joplin, Missouri, for example, of building society back better than the way it was before, of building in uh, impediments to, the, to create a less severe uh, kind of, of catastrophic set of circumstances. In my mind, who better than our GIS uh, professionals to be part of that analysis? And I think that means uh, forward thinking and committed integration of the GIS talents and insights and experience in all phases of the recovery planning and ultimately implementation uh, of those plans, um, endeavor and initiative. Let me give you some examples of where I think GIS uh, brings in immense 
value. First, as part of any comprehensive recovery uh, initiative, it's critical as soon as possible and as rigorously as possible to analyze interdependencies and cascading effects. What I mean by that is, uh, well, start with the old kind of example. Well, if your power's out, you can't pump gas. So you have an interdependency which results in a cascading effect of being you know, uh, shortchanged on, on fuel, for example. That's a simple one. Oftentimes the interdependencies and cascading effects are numerous and complex and, and, and uh, contingent. I think having, and I've shown this you know, in my own life and experience, Having our GIS uh, professionals there, that 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 project becomes uh, very rigorous and and much more successful. If I can ask uh, our our GIS partners, what's linked here? What can you show us in terms of mapping locations and and uh, how things perhaps are are communicating with one another? say through a supply chain uh, or routes of, of ingress and egress. Uh, again, that question, are we missing something? How does the, the, the disaster knit together? And in particular, how can GIS contribute to the identification of whether it's points on a map or demographics uh, or functional kind of identities of, of endeavors and, and enterprises? How do they interact with one another. And if they interact, does it create an independency, interdependency? And if that interdependency exists, what are the potential cascading effects if one part or multiple parts of that building are compromised? Second area I think of, of critical uh, importance, it's kind of related to the first is the potential for GIS professionals using GIS to identify opportunities as well as vulnerabilities. In the opportunity area, take a look at say, uh, in, in coupling you know, GIS uh, with, with uh, demographic data, with economic data, with uh, routes of, of supply, uh, with uh, kind of uh, uh, established support systems, grocery stores, for example, there's many neighborhoods many communities in this country that we characterize as food deserts. Well, what if GIS were a, an integral part of that analysis? And it can be both uh, for purposes of fixing a current problem as well as pre predicting how to make uh, an area or, or even society generally better. Also, what are the vulnerabilities? Uh, in, in some ways, it's, it's a, a wedded sort of endeavor. Uh, to study and analyze uh, what the opportunities are is also potentially to identify what your vulnerabilities are if you can't exploit those opportunities. Again, uh, nothing would delight me more as a uh, recovery manager to be able to have as part of this planning team, GIS professionals where they can contribute their capabilities as well as uh, their ideas, their extensive experience in using maps to unravel problems, uh, but toward a really noble end, uh, namely, how do you leave the place better than the way you found it? Uh, and that comes from understanding. It comes from kind of bold re-envisioning. Third area is uh, GIS by its very nature does something that is really hard to do in many other aspects of governance and recovery. They provide precision and they provide scalability. Uh, both of those uh, are oftentimes components of really effective recovery efforts, uh, recovery initiatives, uh, because they kind of clear the mist away from whether we are kind of doing a swag, doing a guess, and what we actually can know or can't know. And in terms of scalability, uh, as big as a map is, that's the uh, that's the uh, foundation, the footprint of what GIS can provide to us. Oftentimes we don't have visibility on a large scale basis when we are putting together recovery plans. It's, it can be a real challenge. There can be 
communities that we know a lot about, communities that we know a little about. Uh, there are communities that may have uh, elements that we are, you know, kind of reasonably and plausibly assuming about economics and vulnerable populations, access and functional needs population, whole gamut. We can include a GIS level of both scalability and precision uh, that uh, I, over my career, would find absolutely essential in getting the best picture of what it is we need to do. I think the, the next area is, uh, and I've already mentioned this, uh, having the experienced GIS professionals as a full partner uh, in the recovery planning effort, in the identification of requirements, in the identification of opportunities and vulnerabilities, uh, it's how are we implementing these plans, in particular ICS. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, you know, uh, and a lot of actually good work on the role of uh, ICS and GIS in a in a melded sort of way that uh, you know kind of counterpoising particularly issues around logistics with what we can see through a GIS lens uh, becomes absolutely critical and and efficient. Uh, potentially, we could save money. We could save time by identifying where our logistical uh, kind of challenges are as well as where our logistical opportunities are. So uh, I think this is a, a, an area that we can develop much more and we can use in, in practice. But uh, for my part, I think that ICS and GIS, you know, as kind of dual modalities, uh, integrated modalities, is gonna become the coin of the realm. Um, there's one final area, which I think I've already touched on, where I think GIS brings immense value and, and, uh, and efficacy. And it's a big topic facing this country right now. And that's uh, broadly put, social justice and equity. You know, it's been studied pretty widely that a lot of times when money is put into areas of this country that are recovering uh, for, from a disaster, uh, not, not to be too reductionist, uh, but oftentimes the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, that investments, uh, envisioning you know, how to rebuild with a, uh, a priority placed upon social justice and equity, um, it should be the law of the land in a practical matter, as a practical matter, it's, there's some a lot of challenges. There's a lot of work still to be done. I mentioned earlier about the potential for GIS coupled with demographic information to provide uh, what I would call a, an equity map. You know, where are the areas that are the most afflicted and the least repaired? Where are the parts of, of a community that uh, maybe historically uh, have suffered from a lack of investment, uh, a lack of, of, say, opportunity or, you know, the specific infrastructure? You know, whether, again, it's grocery stores or medical clinics or or all the things that go into uh, having a, a just uh, and, and uh, equitable society. Having that power of analysis coupled with the envisioning of a, a just and uh, restored society seems to me uh, probably the highest priority. Uh, and, and it's also a very strong argument for in wherever we can elevating GIS into that full partnership uh, place at the table that I am uh, advocating for. So, you know, I've, I've again worn these two hats over the years. Uh, well, maybe three or four, actually. Uh, again, I'm, I'm currently with the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. Our mission is to provide executive education, policy level education. So I'm, in a sense, talking to policymakers at this juncture in my presentation. I've been a police chief, police officer, uh, 31 years with the Seattle Police Department. I've been in emergency management and I've overseen uh, recovery operations. Um, each of those points of vantage to me uh, and over the years have cried out what I bring to the kind of final area responsibility as a board member of the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation that GIS uh, needs to be utilized as one of the top and most important tiers 
uh, of integrated planning, action planning, implementation, analysis uh, for uh, the important area of recovery. So giving you a little bit to envision, you know, I've, I can recall fairly vividly uh, being uh, part of uh, Nisqually earthquake uh, back in 2001. Uh, recovery um, was a eight year recovery from, uh, from Jump Street to the final closing of the uh, Stafford Act books. Uh, over the course of that, of course, there was a, a, a incredibly busy about six, eight months and then a still regular kind of flow of, of problem solving and, and re-envisioning, um, a lot came out of it. At that time, again, fairly early in, in our you know, kind of history of, of GIS integration, uh, it was the tasking model um, and, and it was invaluable. We had a lot of uh, uh, unreinforced masonry damage to kind of historically important areas of the, the city, a lot of infrastructure damage. A lot of residential damage. We got, you know, kind of views into, you know, some of those questions I've just posed that I think GIS can help us with. But now, uh, if I were able to turn to my GIS colleagues, my my valued uh, professionals, and uh, say, give me a give me a thought, your thoughts on where we should be focusing, you know, as you're looking at you know, the 40,000 view um, uh, kind of uh, vision of what is being done, where the damage is, what needs to be done. Uh, what, what leaps out? Um, I mean, that would be the initial question. The, the next one, and I think it's vitally important is, and what should we be thinking about to make the world a better place? At least the place that our citizens can recognize before the disaster disaster and, and certainly uh, the place that they want to live in, a place more resilient, uh, a place that's hardened against uh, the same kind of, of challenges and disaster effects uh, that brought us to the recovery table in the first place. Uh, give me your thoughts, give me, let's do think tank. Um, and then once we figure out, well, what if, Help me realize that. Help me understand what that uh, that what if looks like, um, and and how through mapping and photography and analysis we can restore uh, the world to the place we want it to be. So I've made a bit of an impassioned argument, but I'm also bringing experience to the table. Uh, I hope in uh, presenting these ideas that we I'm setting the stage for some of the presentations that you will also uh, be able to access. Uh, I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, in all of these uh, efforts, these recovery um, initiatives, you're not alone. We're not alone. FEMA is a great partner. They're going to be at the table. We know that FEMA utilizes uh, or supports the utiliza utilization of GIS very strongly. Um, we have private sector partners. You're going to hear from one of uh, our, uh, my fellow board member, Chris Matchenberg from CSX. Uh, we have uh, experience. We have the collective work of some real pioneers uh, who have dealt with disasters themselves and who, in my experience, uh, share openly what their lessons learned were, what their plans are. But I also think that uh, you don't have to be bad to be better. And we can bring our uh, re recovery science, our recovery process into uh, an even greater and greater system of equity and efficacy uh, by realizing as we need to do all the time that there may be people at the table uh, that, uh, th that uh, are people that are not at the table that need to be there. I'm looking forward to uh, the session we're going to record uh, at the conclusion of uh, our presentations. And that is when we all four of us get together and we're going to kind of simulate GIS uh, in the role that I'm describing. Uh, it'll be kind of a round table, kind of a, of a seminar. And uh, I hope it puts a capstone on some of the things that uh, I've been able to share with you. Great privilege 
uh, to share my thoughts with you. And uh, I wish you well in all of your great endeavors. Uh, I, I sincerely believe that society owes a, a big debt of thanks to our GIS professionals.